and enter your life. Good morning and welcome to the ODPP Cafe. Uh, this is uh, brought to you by the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. It's Friday and today we are going to go on an education journey with you. We welcome you to like us on Facebook. We welcome you to subscribe on our YouTube page and also follow us on Twitter. On Twitter, we are at ODPP underscore KE. On Facebook, we are at the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. And on YouTube, we are also uh, in the page of the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. We welcome you to subscribe. And when you subscribe every Friday when we have the show, it will always uh, pop up on your screens just as a reminder so that you don't have to wait for the link every time it comes up. So Karibu Sana, welcome. We welcome you to engage. We welcome you to ask us questions. We have a team of experts as usual who will definitely uh, help us to understand what uh, our, our topic uh, is today. The topic has been on social media from, uh, from Monday and today is just a culmination of the topic and uh, where we now have experts giving us more information about it. So as usual, before uh, we start our discussion, I am going to take you through a quick roundup of the courts and to just tell you what has been going on uh, in the courts. Just a few cases, like I normally say, this is not everything. Just a few of the cases we've picked up for you to just see what has been happening there. The first case is um, about uh, former CS Henry Rotich and uh, 13 KVDA officials. They pleaded not guilty to corruption charges in the Aror and Kimware uh, dam scam, the 50.1 billion dam scam. I know we've discussed about this when we were doing the anti-corruption uh, session. We People had wanted to know about the Aror and Kimware uh, case. So here it is. Rotich pleaded not guilty to the charges, which included abuse of office, conspiracy to defraud uh, the public, and failure to comply with guidelines relating to procurement and financial misconduct, among others. So uh, Rotich was in court this week and uh, with uh, 13 other KVDA officials. They pleaded, he pleaded not guilty, so the case is ongoing. Um, just a minute. So the prosecution submitted that no due diligence was uh, done when vetting CMC di Ravenna, remember this company, from Italy, before it was awarded the contract to build the dam. So the DPP seeking to extradite CMC di Ravenna, Italian director Paolo po Pocelli, Pocelli, on corruption charges. So that case is on. Um, that's a quick update on the um, Aurora and Kimware case. Uh, the next case you're looking at is uh, a, an MP, an MP elect called Robert Oimeke, uh, Bonchari MP elect Robert Oimeke. Uh, the anti-corruption court ordered a 500,000 graft case against the MP to pro proceed in a physical court on, ju on July 5th, that is uh, in another month's time. The case earlier on had been listed on for a virtual hearing for two days before the chief magistrate, Peter Oyoko, but could not proceed after Oimeke was said to be unwell. So uh, Oimeke is facing a charge of receiving 200K bribe from an employee of a petrol station in Oyugi's Homer Bay. He's out on cash bail. Uh, we talked about cash bail, so it doesn't mean he's gone for free. He's still going to answer to these charges as th that have been brought to, uh, against him. So the next case is about three men who are found guilty of 13 million tax evasion. Uh, a Mombasa politician and two traders were found guilty of ev evading 13 million tax by under declaring rice imported from Zanzibar. The three convicted of the offense committed, it was committed in 2019. These are Maur Abdallah, Captain Shipping Agency Director Ali Mohammed, and uh, uh, just a minute. And uh, so the prosecution submitted that the consignee agent unlawfully made the report by declaring that the vessel had a thousand bags of rice instead of 15,000. He arrested said the accused also declared 10 tons of scrap metal instead of 16 tons on the ship. The cargo on the ship was valued to be more than 22.5 million. So they are going to answer to charges of tax evasion. So this other next case is about a driver who is going to jail for one year after he fails to raise a fine of 500,000 Kenya shillings. Amon Kipnyatich was charged for evading the Athi River Way Bridge, which is contrary to the East African Community Vehicle Load Control Act of 2016. So he was fined 500,000, he could not raise it, and so he's being sentenced to one year in jail for evading the Way Bridge. 
The East African Community Vehicle Load Control Act allows the community to jointly fight the deterioration of the paved road network due to overloading. So this guy could not raise his bay, his fine, and as a result, he's going to jail for one year. So this other case is about uh, cops who are convicted of manslaughter. They have been jailed to seven years in jail. Uh, former administration police officers, two of them, were found guilty of uh, manslaughter charges and were sentenced to seven years in jail. Justice Jesse Lesit, who read the sentence on behalf of Stella Mutuku, sentenced Constables William Churchill and Godfrey Kirui for killing Janet Waiyaki at City Park in Nairobi on May 20th, 2018. So the case was concluded. They were found guilty and they were sentenced to seven years in jail. These were cops. Um, so while sentencing the two, the judge noted that they, they were first first time offenders, but declined to give them an uncustodial sentence, of course, saying it is not appropriate. So they have to serve time for this for this uh, for this case for manslaughter. Those are the cases we had a roundup on today. Like I said, they're not exhaustive. A lot has been happening in the courts. Most of those that were going virtual have now gone back to physical court. But then um, we need to get into a discussion of the day, discussion of the week, which has been SGBV, sexual gender based violence. We've had some posts on both Twitter and Facebook trying to just tell you what the law, how the law works in SGBV cases. Allow me to just continue by uh, using the acronym SGBV, but it is sexual and gender based violence. So we've been doing some postings on Facebook and trying to just explain uh, how the law works, especially from the ODPP point of view. And today we continue with the discussion uh, with, the, with two experts on the, on the topic. And I want to invite them and allow them to introduce themselves. Ladies first, Madam Jacinta, please introduce yourself. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jacinta Nyamusi. I'm the acting deputy director in the Department of uh, Conventional Related uh, Crimes. Uh, the, the division that deals with the SGBV is a, a division under the state department. I have been a prosecutor since uh, 2000 and I have handled matters related to SGBV since 2007 when the act came into, into force. Oh. So that is a, a small uh, brief background about, about me. Yeah. I'm a prosecutor and I actively participate in court. Even if it's not an, on a day-to-day -day basis, I do uh, prosecute cases and I have uh, uh, prosecuted several cases that relate to sexual uh, SGBV. Ah, okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Karibu sana to the show. We Thank definitely you. look forward to your expert opinion Thank you. about this. Yes. Thank you. Yes, on my part, my name is uh, Donek Sangira. I'm an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, uh, having practiced as an advocate for the past seven years. I'm equally uh, prosecuting counsel in the office of the ODPP. Uh, currently at uh, Kiambu Law Court, um, as Madam has rightly said, <laughs> on my part, I am actively on the ground <laughs> in yes. prosecuting these cases, mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad to be here today to at least just uh, educate the public and uh, whoever needs this information for their benefit today yes thank you very much for having us today karibu sana yes so like you said this show is about educating people and informing i'm also learning yes so i will just want to know more about sgbv as it is mm -hmm. and so we can't start this discussion without defining it as in classroom definition what is sgbv all right just as the word uh, as the synonym is sexual and gender-based violence uh this is violence which is visited or uh, committed against uh, a group of individuals or an individual because of their gender, which of which gender can speak to a male, female, and now we have what we refer to as intersex. So if viol violence is uh, um, committed against you because of your gender, then it, it comes out to, 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 to be what you refer to as sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, there are many ways of uh, sexual uh, gender-based violence being committed against you. It can be uh, maybe mental, physical, sexual. There are many ways in which uh, SGBV can be uh, committed against an individual or, or a group of individuals. So basically, generally, that's what SGBV uh, refers, refers to. <laughs> anyway, so when we talk about uh, SGBV, we said the act came in force in 2007. Yes, the act came into force in 2000 and, uh, 
2006, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, uh, the 2007 is when I actively uh, came to, to, yes, so 2006 is when it came into force. Um, previously, we were actually working with the penal code. I wanted to ask what was there before. Yeah. Yes, yeah. oh yes, we were working with the penal code. These were offenses which were called offenses against the morality. So you can see how not serious it was taken at that point. Yes. But uh, you see, after the 2006, uh, sexual offenses were seen to be very serious offenses, yeah. and hence why we had to have an act which we're going to deal, which we're going to deal with sexual offenses specifically. Okay. Yes. So the next, just um, just to further define this, does this have to be sexual? Uh, as to be doesn't necessarily have to be sexual. Uh, yeah, this is ordinary assault and domestic violence that we can call within the average sector. Sex uh, STD. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, most people when they think about STD, the only thing that it, it comes to their mind is the sexual yeah. aspect of it. Yes, of but, God, it's yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. But uh, if you look at it holistically, this is not these are not offenses that are only limited to sexual acts alone. Mm -hmm. It can be a violence against a woman, a violence against a child who's a girl or a boy. So it's expansive yeah. in itself. So it doesn't, it, it can be violence that is not sexual, yes, but yes. still falls under this. Exactly. Ah, okay, okay. So, madam, what are the common forms of, how does it manifest? How does uh, SDP money manifest? What cases do you see in the SDP? Uh, mostly the offenses which... Uh, are reported and which we uh, we process on a day-to-day -day basis. There are many, of course, under the Sexual Offences Act and under the Penal Code when we are talking of the other type of violence. We are talking about the sexual violence itself, the sexual offences. Yes. Yes. We are talking about uh, violence, uh, domestic violence. We are talking about FGM. We are talking about um, rape. rape. Uh, de uh, defilement now when we are specific to, to, to yes. children, yes. then there is incest. Incest is one of the most common, uh, of, yes, it is very, very common, and the, the statistics will uh, talk about it, will speak to these kind of offenses. So generally, these are the ones which we encounter, notwithstanding there's also uh, sexual harassment, uh, probably in an, in an office setup. Yes. These are things which take place, but uh, the ones we encounter mostly the, the ones uh, which we have. Ones, yeah. Yeah. So then I'll ask something that somebody asked on social media. Why are women the face of SGBV yet you said that SGBV includes male or the boy child like we call them so why are women the face of SGB because even us when we put up our poster mm -hmm. we had a woman and somebody was quick to ask us why are using women yet even men are affected uh, this is something we have grappled with and it uh, it really uh, it, it disturbs us also as prosecutors yes. because we know that men are also violated um, in terms of when we are talking of uh, SGBV I don't know whether it's a uh, culture, uh, the male ego, people don't want, what, the man is seen to be the tough person in the society or in a home setup. So he will be embarrassed possibly to talk about it, that he's being beaten by his wife or his girlfriend. So it goes out to speak that um, men need to, you know, we need to talk more to the men, mm. tell them this is not something that should embarrass you. Mm. And uh, and I'm thinking that when these reports are made in the police station, uh, you know, the gender desks are, um, are assumed to be where women go to, but there should be some more privacy given to uh, even men who have been violated. So I think it all goes down, how are we talking to the public? Yeah. What, how are we communicating with them? Have we told them that uh, we care about them also as men, as men because we have seen men who have really been harmed by their wives and uh, and uh, they have not spoken about it because they are so embarrassed the neighbor there's somebody they are working with will talk about it. even the family will tell him you are a man how can you go ahead it's it falls down it's culture it's ego something to do with ego it's many things yes. so it is um, something which would be appealing possibly through this uh, uh, platform and tell the men 
if you're hurting don't 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 uh, sit back and wait to 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 get killed because some of these things escalate to other offenses yes. so this is the opportunity to also speak to them to the men please come out report yes. we will try as much as possible to keep this as confidential as possible even hearings if we can have if the man will be so embarrassed to talk about it we can make an application in court to have these matters heard in camera so that um, uh, we we kind of give some sort them. of confidentiality. Yes. Yes. So I'm wondering because you say that there can be sexual, yeah. there can be non-sexual, but all under SGBB. For a woman, I would I think I'd fall would fall on on both naturally. You're either sexually naturally. abused yes. or you're non-sexually abused, but yes. you're abused anyway. Exactly. Do men face the same? <laughs> men do face the same. Yeah. And, and 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 as uh, as Madame Nemosi has correctly said, yeah. um, I think it boils down to morality as well. Yes. And what culture has set up uh, for men over the years, and if, uh, of course, if you also look at the historical injustices, um, ordinarily men shun away from making reports in in court, yes. or even to the police station with respect to uh, gender-based violence, on the pretext of them being, you know, tagged as either being weaklings yeah, or, or sissies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if, if that's the right, the right time yeah. to uh, term to use. Uh, for instance, uh, I actually have interacted with a case that I think occurred about two weeks ago, whereby a gentleman or a lady actually had a scuffle. And what transpired is that the lady actually slapped the man. See? He didn't really hit the, uh, the girl back, but he insulted her. But the lady went to the police station to make a report. And later on, after now the man was arrested, that's when he was raising a complaint. And he was saying, look, this person actually slapped me. The first question, you'll, as a prosecutor, the first thing you have to realize is, was evidence properly or procedurally uh, collected? When I asked him, did you make an, uh, a report at the police station? He told me, no, I didn't do it. Why? Because I'm a man. Yeah, they're happy. What, 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 you know? <laughs> yeah. So there, there is that culture that has developed um, uh, and has been okayed by society yeah. that men necessarily don't really have to report yeah. and they have to take in all these issues eh? when in fact yeah. an offense is an offense it doesn't matter whether it's perpetrated yeah, against a woman yeah. or against a man, man yes. so as madama said men should actually be encouraged to also report make reports yes i think the question directly that i'm asking i've gotten the right question yes do you find cases of men sexually abused in their marriages men or their relationships in my practice, I have not really interacted with a case of a man who is sexually abused in his lifetime as an adult, in his marriage or in, a, in, in the relationship. Mm -hmm. But I have interacted with a situation where, whereby a boy child yes. has been abused by uh, the caregiver. The caregiver. And, you know, you're looking at the circumstances and how the law has been crafted as well. When it comes, when, 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 when you're looking at offenses and you want to, when a charge has been brought before you, for instance, and you're looking at the ingredients that then form that, that particular charge, if you look at the specific ingredients for defilement, for instance, you'll see that those ingredients are aligned towards a particular angle, and that is towards the girl child, for instance, yes. and leaves out there boy the child. boy child. Such that then, when you're sitting down to, uh, to consider what evidence then you should have, mm -hmm. When now a boy child, for instance, has been defiled, you have so many questions that yeah. that needs to be answered. Yeah. Because for a girl child, all, what you need to look at, number one, is of course the age. That no, nobody can dispute. Yes. The other thing is if there was penetration, for instance, so you need a, a post-rape care report or a P3 form. It will clearly indicate in that particular, particular yeah. form. But when it comes to a boy child, what mechanisms have actually been set yeah. to satisfy the what prosecutor, are those yeah. that this thing needs to be ticked, like this has been satisfied that this particular boy has been defiled for instance. Defiled. So there's always that injustice and you feel like the boy child is actually left out. Yeah. And the Sexual Offenses Act or uh, sexual gender-based violence is actually uh, inclined towards addressing women. women. Maybe that's why then the face of SDB is normally women. Of course. Because maybe again we fall into the sexually and then sexually and then the law has really uh, given provisions for for how, how it uh, conducts the women cases. And also looking at the historical injustices that have occurred yes. over the past, especially towards women. Yes. Then of course, 
it would bring a situation whereby something needs to be brought about to protect the rights and dignity of, of, the, women. of the women. And then we are patriarchal society as of well. Course, yes. But then I'm thinking again, men could find, find themselves in such situations during war yes. or even in a robbery. So it's not necessarily within a relationship that they'd be sexually abused. So maybe uh, election violence, maybe a robbery has taken place, yes. or just maybe during war. I mean, yeah. It, it, it does happen. Mm. It does happen. Uh, uh, like, like you said, in violence, yes. violent situations, you'll always find situations where men are abused by fellow men. Yes. And that, that's not just um, outside the borders okay. of the court system or the justice sector. Uh, most of these offenses are usually actually per perpetrated within the prison settings as well. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, because some of the cases are, that we interact with about, you know, uh, homosexuality, for instance, yeah. are usually perpetrated within the, pri uh, yeah. the prison settings. Yeah. But then if you look at the way our constitution has also been set, it, 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 uh, it, it, comes, it brings about that aspect of reconciliation as well. So you'll always find that fine, they'll, they'll come to court, someone will make a report, they'll come to court. But because of that fear of being castigated for being a man and having gone through that experience, you know, they always shy away to proceed with the case. So the most, the interest that this person has is, I made a report, I went to court, this person has been, as long as society knows that this person has done yeah. this particular Leave act me to me, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe again now that you said talked about uh, homosexuality, maybe now in the offices again you find the boy child also exposed to sexual abuse in the office setting. So yes. maybe now for this show is to encourage them to come forward, yes. right? Yes. So Madame, we spoke about culture and how it has possibly contributed to SGVB. And I want to know about FGM. Is it a form of actually you mentioned it that it is a form of of F of SGBV. But male circumcision, is it? That's a very, very interesting uh, question, very interesting. Uh, we'll, there are ways of looking at it. One, medically, um, it has been proven that male circumcision is, is quite all right, oh, yes. and it's safe, and possibly it's even uh, healthy. That is what the medics have, have told us. Again, uh, look at the culture, even religion allows for male circumcision. Yes. Um, even biblically, you know, that allows. But again, culture, this is where culture comes in. It's, uh, it's uh, not automatic that it's all uh, um, males who are circumcised. Again, goes back to culture. It's not believed that you need to be to, to go through circumcision. Mm. So for me, what I would say when we are talking of male circumcision and when it falls under the category of GBV, SGBV, is when it's forceful. Yes. Forceful male circumcision then now becomes a crime. A crime. Because there's a reason why a particular group of people feel that they need not go through circumcision. Yes. And it has worked for them. Yes. So that is, uh, that is something which, uh, I, that's how I can uh, uh, talk about it. Mm. And I know that during the post-election uh, violence, that's 2007, uh, eight, we had so many cases of uh, forced circumcision. Forced circumcision. Um, and it's because one person's, uh, one uh, group of people feel their culture is superior to the yeah. other. So we have to force this. Yeah. It happened. But again, the question is, did these people report? They didn't report. They talked about it to the media. They talked about it to their yeah, relatives, but they didn't report. Then the question is, um, then did we, uh, could we have an opportunity to, to charge? And in any event, again, what is really disturbing is that um, uh, male circumcision somehow has not really fallen into the purview of being seen as GBV. This is what's also disturbing. Mm -hmm. Mostly what somebody might easily be charged with, if at all they report, is uh, maybe grievous harm. Yeah. Because you have, uh, I mean, I'm sure that kind of um, uh, an, uh, an injury will be termed as uh, grievous harm. Yes. So this is this, this work in progress. And as we keep on uh, uh, engaging with uh, these kind of offenses each day, uh, we are able to see where there is a lacuna and and uh, we, a law reform is something yeah. which is continuous, continuous and it's something which we can be able to to to, to work with. Yeah. Is with there them. a point where FGM is is accepted? Is there an exception? 
FGM, we are talking about FGM for the women. For the women now. Yes, female. Uh, we are yes. Talking, yeah. yeah, now. Because they now have an exception. No, yeah. no, 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 no. That's FGM. No, 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 no. FGM <laughs> is just not. It's not just allowed. It's just not allowed. Okay. It's just culture. Again, culturally, yeah. you find some communities are actually uh, doing, are going ahead to perform FGM, and they justify, and it. They justify it, saying that it is all right, yeah. it's safe, and all this. But it's not safe. It has been proven again. Just uh, the opposite of what we are talking of male yes. circumcision. Female circumcision has been proven to be very, very dangerous to women, yeah. and especially when they are about to give back to children. Yeah. And even uh, it has caused deaths. Yeah. So FGM is just not allowed. Not even allowed. the law is our, F, our 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 law speaks for itself. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So something else about religion and culture. So religion says I am my body belongs to my husband once I'm married. Culture says he owns my body. But now the law says there's rape in marriage. Does the law, how, how do I even go about saying I have been raped in my marriage? First and foremost, I need to clarify. Yeah. Rape in mar marriage has not been provided for under the Sexual oh, Offenses okay. Act. Okay. And I'll give you the history. When the Sexual Offenses Act was, uh, was in the process of being enforced, it was one of the, it, 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 uh, uh, rape in marriage was one of the offenses which was uh, uh, targeted to be part of the S S S SOA. Yes. But for some reason, the, the, the members of parliament of the day were not really comfortable mm -hmm. with that mm -hmm. because they are partly, uh, you know, they are in this society, they live in this society. And you never know, I'm not saying they have committed, they possibly may have uh, could easily have fallen prey yes. and being, uh, you know, being accused of having committed. Yes. So for us, there is no offense like rape in rape marriage. In marriage. Mm. So that one is just not there. Oh, interesting. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the next, just give us a view of consent. Because a lot of sexual offenses is because you took it by force. Yes. I didn't allow you to do this. So how, what is consent, first of all? And when is it not consent? When is it consent? See, consent is a is a very interesting attribute when you're considering uh, uh, basically the law yeah. uh, generally, mm. because they say either it can be in writing or it can be by conduct, the manner in which someone actually behaves towards a particular circumstance, and when you consider SGBV, uh, one thing that especially sexual violence that is, the one thing that you must always be alive to is that in most instances, the only person who will actually witness what is happening is the victim yes you get uh -huh. and that's always a challenge uh -huh. so consent by action for instance uh you know as long as because every, every everybody records statements in the first place we have the opportunity of interviewing witnesses there are files that come to court and of course you see uh there's some malice somewhere you know, yeah. either someone's an adult, uh, both parties are adults, mm -hmm. but there's a sister somewhere who has an interest about something and is pushing. But when you probe more, you actually get to realize that, you know, these people are probably boyfriend and girlfriend. There's only that maybe she was, you know, at home. I mean, my yeah. high school and all that, you know. But ordinarily, for consent, it must be expressed if there is something to consider. There must be no doubt whatsoever that ah, ilikuwa ama haikuwa. Mm. You get so number one you can't but i uh, actually put it by conduct of the person as long as someone says no and, and this is something that i like to encourage men there's, there's this there's this notion <laughs> yeah. that ordinarily when a woman says no she means yes yes i know is a no mm. that is something that should go out and no at any point is a, a no. no is a no mm. if a woman says no to you don't insult them insult because you never know where it will actually yes. it will actually go. Mm -hmm. If, for instance, even in the course of uh, sexual uh, sexual gender based violence, you know, by the act or conduct of the lady or the victim of that particular offense, uh, she can be able to demonstrate in court that look, by my conduct alone, I was not willing to participate in this particular offense. Mm. That in itself is sufficient to actually warrant a conviction okay. in itself. Yeah. But it's, like I said before, it's something that's very unique because ordinarily in sexual offenses, 
the victim is always most times the only eyewitness so it's the evidence of the so victim the word against yes the word the, the word of the victim against that of the the perpetrator yeah. unfortunately that's quite unfortunate because yeah. uh, <laughs> um so what happens when we are in the middle of it and then i say a hey, boss no and then you tell you you go and say but by yes. conduct we were already so is <laughs> <laughs> so when when does no apply? I mean because you see that I think the problem with the SGBV, Madam, and you may agree, is yes. consent. It's consent. The concept of consent. At what point does consent not apply? Number one, consent doesn't apply to children. Period. Period. Yes. It does not apply to children. Even if you look at leave alone even uh, the SOA itself. Yeah. Even if you look at contract, a child can't get into a contract. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and that's why in most uh, defilement cases, for instance, there'll always be the minor who records the statement, yeah. and then there'll always be a guardian or a parent uh -huh. to enforce that which happened, mm -hmm. and the evidence of that gu uh, that guardian, based on what was reported to her by the by the minor, mm -hmm. is considered to be very strong evidence mm -hmm. in terms of uh, considering conviction in court. Yeah, but uh, like you said, consent at before. The whole thing goes on. That's where consent actually applies. Ah. It's not in the cause of it. Because if you come to court and then you start telling the court, like, look, yeah, mm -hmm. we, we were in the process of having their decided. Mm -hmm. Ah, look, now I'm not going to have it. Come on. <laughs> I don't know how to start asking my question. You know? But honestly, consent should actually apply at any point. It should apply before all this happens. I, in my opinion. So there's another, um, I think I read it somewhere too. To me under football, yes. to me on a game, to Karudi kwa Charlie, mm -hmm. had a few drinks, then I decided to sleep over. Mm -hmm. I put on his t-shirt, mm -hmm. I jump onto his bed. By conduct, I, the guy assumes we have to do it. No. You see now? That's an assumption. That's an assumption. That's but an then, assumption, yes. this guy goes ahead and does it. Then when I wake up, I scream rape. And then he says, lakini si uli kuja kwa bed yangu. No, no, you, you see conduct. Conduct is not the manner in which you're behaving before all this happens. Fine, it can be considered, but at the point of this person having sexual intercourse with, with the victim, yeah. how was she behaving? Was she, because you see, that there, there, there are situations whereby, like you said, let's use that example for yeah. instance. You're from the game, menda kwake umevang, umevati shatiyake. You've had a few, yeah. you know, drinks here and there, you passed out, and then you wake up and that is happening. That in itself is rape because yes. there is no consent in the yeah. first place. Yeah. You get? Yes. So, like I said, consent has to be before. And it's not consent about me wearing a shirt, or walking fair. around, or kukula fair. Mm -hmm. It's about the act itself. That is where it stops. The ball stops with the act. Mm -hmm. Because when you go, because the moment you go to court, you're not going to say, like, look, I'm in court because you, you see the way the charges are drafted. Eh? It will not be, you're not being charged for wearing this person's shirt. Yes. You know, it is for having sexual intercourse without this person's consent. If it's uh, consent, that is rape, right? So the facts of that particular case will be limited to the act, the sexual act, okay. and nothing else. Okay. Yes. I think you can discuss consent for most of <laughs> for most of today. But then, Madam, how do you go about reporting uh, um, uh, an SGBV case? What is the process? Um. It, uh, it starts uh, with the policeman? It, it starts, you know, mm -hmm. something very interesting with uh, sexual offences. It may even start from the hospital. It mm -hmm. depends on how badly the victim has been mm -hmm. uh, uh, harmed. Mm -hmm. But ordinarily where the, an act has taken place, uh, the victim uh, is, supposed, is not supposed to show yeah. completely. Mm -hmm. They are supposed to go as they are. That is, you may feel in the body, you must move to the police station and report it. That is, should be the first place of report. However, we have had instances where the person is so badly injured, the first point of contact will be the hospital. Then it's the hospital which will now make a referral to, especially if it's a child, will make a referral to the uh, to have this matter reported in the, mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the police station. But at the end of the day, a report must be made at the police station, an OB entry must be made that this, this, this happened. Mm -hmm. that so what's, yeah, so what's the essence of not showering? So I go to the police station and report I didn't shower. What, what are they supposed to do? 
uh, the policeman the, the policeman immediately you uh, they're supposed to actually take you to hospital so that a swab is taken from you and you are, you are given an examination and through the examination they are able to 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 fill it, fill out the prc to form the, that is the whole idea prc it's That's a post rape care, care form yes, yes. we used to have the p3 which used mm. to be the place where we could have the uh, sexual offenses reported but now specific to sexual offenses we have the post rape care form which which is so details detailed that you can be able to tell what exactly has uh, happened and the opinion of the doctor is uh, set out in uh, that uh, uh, PRC okay. form all right yeah. so the police uh, do this they collect my the evidence from me no no the police just take you to the experts who will collect the, the swab. evidence oh, okay the poli the policeman will record the manner in which they even saw you how you looked uh, in the ob and then take you to the hospital now that is where the expert is mm. the doctors will be able to collect a swab from from your body which is now the uh, crime scene actually your body now f becomes a crime scene yes. they are able to take that uh, swab the swab is now now taken to the uh, government chemist for purposes of processing to establish uh, whatever it is the whether this was the perpetrator, the person you have pointed out, and all that. So each person plays their role. The police knows, they report, they take. They will not touch you. They'll take you to the... And then the investigations, of course, will go on. They might go to the yeah. where this thing happened and whatever. But your body forms the first place where the crime scene uh, they, uh, forms the first part okay, of crime. crime. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so what if I can get help at the police station? You've had cases of, mm. I've gone to report... So, yeah. <laughs> mm. I mean, like there's a case I had about, and I think we have the video somewhere, mm. a woman in Kibera, she has been married for 17 years and she has been thwacked for all those 17 years. Mm. So the same chief takes her information, the same cops take her information, but now they become buddies. They don't even want to listen to her. When I say, Masasa, where are Chota? By child to scare story, she's gone to a shelter, and we'll talk about shelters later. Mm. She's gone to a temporary shelter because it can't house her for long. She has to go back to the same, to same, same house. So, where can that person go? She's not getting help within her local, uh, uh whatever uh, administration space. Where can they go? Can they come here, for example? Can they come to the ODPP direct? I, I, I believe, I believe the ODPP has an open door policy when it comes to complaints of such, of such nature yeah um and and, and and i thank the dpp for actually encouraging that open the policy because like you said we can't wish away the fact that at times when people or victims go to report certain cases they are treated in a particular manner such that then they feel that mm -hmm. their issues are not properly addressed yeah but what what now the public must realize is that one of the core mandates of the dpp is equally to direct the police to investigate. Mm -hmm. You get. Yeah. So once a report has actually, a, a report can actually be made at the DPP. Oh, okay. As a way of a complaint against either a particular station or a particular officer or a particular chief. Yeah. You know, a report can be made against anyone about their conduct in the manner in which a criminal element is being investigated ah. or conducted. Once that then happens, then now the mandate now falls mm -hmm. on the DPP, then to direct the Inspector General to look, in, to look into that particular matter. And I mm -hmm. believe when it gets to that particular level, irrespective of who it is, mm -hmm. who knows who, mm -hmm. at the grassroots, some action will be taken. Sh should actually be taken yeah. and expedited, yes. Yeah. But that, that in no way should not be an excuse. Mm -hmm. This particular victim as well should realize that at a police station level as well, you know, it's not only those policemen who can actually assist. I believe there's a hierarchy of, you know, yes, <laughs> of, pol of police officers. They, they went from the OCS to the, you know, to the DCIO, for instance, the county commander. But you can still be frustrated. You can still, but you, the open door police at the DPP, I believe, in so my in my experience them, yeah. within this office, it has assisted a lot a lot of people who had complaints mm -hmm. about investigations or the manner in which they were treated when they made the initial reports. Mm -hmm. okay. yes. And my, my, maybe just to add on to that, mm -hmm. uh, in the example that you have uh, cited, mm -hmm. where she goes and comes back, goes and comes back, mm -hmm. 
um, the problem is that uh, possibly even the first time she reported the matter was uh, taken to court or something was done. Uh, but uh, as you start processing the case in court, she possibly withdrew. Oh, yes. You, you know, um, as much as we want to blame the, the law enforcement or the criminal justice actors, we have to also look like um, us as victims. If I have been a, a, a victim of violence, if I want to look serious, I should uh, process the case to its logical conclusion. Once, maybe you can forgive. Twice, thrice. Now, when you keep on going 10, uh, 11 Many times, times yeah. uh, you, you may put these officers in a situation where they might actually think you're also not serious. Mm. So if it's once, twice, forgive. More than that, I think now process the case, let this person learn a lesson. But again, the problem that uh, um, which uh, people encounter, you find that women of this, uh, women who have uh, been uh, who have been violently um, or beaten up, most of them are the ones who are housewives. They wait for the man. The man is the one who is the breadwinner. Uh, they might have a problem even going, uh, you know, proceeding with the case. So again, it's a, a give and take. Uh, are there safe houses? Safe houses have proven to be a very big challenge in the in the in the yes. Uh, yes. And we just need to speak about that in a bit. But then, yes. do we have witness protection in SGBV cases? Yes, very much so. I can actually allude to four cases. Oh, good. Where I have had my witnesses, my victim, uh, evacuated by a witness protection agency. And they have assisted to the extent that even when the case is ongoing, they provide psychosocial and even intermediary services. Mm -hmm. So the witness protection agency is one of the agencies, especially in uh, uh, of sexual offenses, which affect children where they have really helped us. Because they are, uh, they have the experts within the agency themselves. Yes. Mm. They have, an, uh, they, they they can confidentially remove that witness from where they are and keep them in such a place that you, they are safe. Yes. The prosecutor need not know where the the their, oh. um, their victim is coming from. All they need is to just inform the witness protection agency. But they need to appear. They right? need to appear, and they do it so perfectly. So perfectly. And I, in, in those cases, we have had convictions because of the money in which uh, uh, witness protection. Yes. Yeah, so then the other question I have is, society, culture, sometimes does not allow women, for example, because men, men, men is a different case, but yes. doesn't allow women to even report these cases or even go through the cases. I will report and then I'll be told, come on, father of your children, married for many years, sole provider, you know? Why do you want to spoil all this for one? For one or two cases, vumilia to ama you asked ni nini ujafanya. Sometimes you even go to your priest, you're like, oh my my my. And I come here, there's something you didn't do. So the so sometimes uh, in as much as you want to go through with a case, then you find culture comes in, society comes in. But then the question I have is, have you had any case where you've had a strong case but culture stepped in, and then then the case? Do you drop such cases or do you go on because again you're the public defender? Uh. That does happen uh, in most circumstances, but I believe every case is assessed on the strength of the evidence that you have. You don't just drop a case because certain people in the society, you know, want it dropped. The first person that you have to have in that that you have to have at the back of your mind is the victim. victim. Uh, take for example a situation whereby this is something that has periodically happened. Assault, for instance, uh, domestic violence. It has happened periodically. And this is the one time that, say, for instance, if I can be a visa, it can be the end of So when they, when they went to the hospital, the doctors had to make a report that this person has come to the hospital with, uh, to the hospital with this particular injury. And this is the nature of yeah. situation surrounding this particular injuries. Then, of course, someone is arrested. And then we're talking. Same on next time, hospital when you are alive, what happens? Mm -hmm. So this should be a reflection of an, an individual person as well. Because even when they want to come for that reconciliation, as is allowed by the law, you see, as a prosecutor, when you are now exercising your due diligence, the first thing you have to do is actually interview this particular person. Get to know what exactly happened. Yeah. It might be intimidation. 
that culture itself, these people telling, oh, he's a provider, that is actually intimidation, uh, in, uh, intimidation of witnesses as well. Mm -hmm. And the good thing, and unfortunately most people don't know this, but I want to tell them that the law allows that such people can actually be charged in court. Or oh, the people who tell you. Oh, yes. Oh. They mm. can be charged in court. Oh, interesting. So and what, I think it's such a big problem. It is such a big mm. problem because most cases come to court. Then one month, two months down the road, during the mention, people, you know, they, they still hot tempers yes, here yes. and there. Because mm -hmm. mentions after 14 days after taking plea. So there's hot, hot tempers. People don't want to listen to each other at town yeah. And then the hearing would apart, unfortunately, for a system, uh, hearing in Ecuador after like two, three months away. So by the time they're coming on that day, you've taken your file, you've gone through it. You know, you're satisfied that Wherever, whatever happens in this particular case, I'm going to secure, uh, to secure conviction. I'm going to. You're sure about your you're, case. You are certain about your case. Yeah. You conduct pretrial. You are you are certain about it, and then you come to court, and this person and, and in one corner and say, "Oh, are you ready for the case?" In fact, I'm in some hair. It happens, and unfortunately, it happens. It happens this way because there's also people who misadvise victims and even suspects yes. in cases about the conduct of trial. Mm -hmm. And you see, most in most instances, this happens first we get as, 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 as an ambush. The good thing is that as prosecutors, we have control over the process of the trial as well. Mm -hmm. to, some, to some extent, right? The court has full control, some control, yeah. and so does the, the DPP. Yeah. So in most instances, when that happens, I would, I would always encourage people, take time to actually talk to professionals to prosecutors. Now let us know whether you have even had counseling in the first place because yeah. that is something that people don't even Think consider. Yeah. They don't even do it in the first place. Mm. Because if you actually sit down, th th there is there's there's one specific case I don't want to mention there because it's still yeah. active in court. But this is a case where someone had actually been tortured in her house. You know, when uh, the case came to court, it has had a lot of back and forth, you know, because when the advocates are there, these parties can't see eye to eye. Our target kuskiza wana kwa kiangalia kando, but the moment the advocate walk out, they walk in together holding hands. To me, some mehe na kwa target kisi toke. Lakini kisi kwenye layer donex, are they living in the same house? No, no, they're not living in the same house anymore. Okay. But you see, for such circumstances, you're okay. better off having that case proceed mm. and determine because you don't know what the motive of behind this particular action yeah. is exactly. Yeah. Can you force a witness? Can you force a victim to to continue the case? It is not encouraged. <laughs> I must say it's not encouraged. Yeah. But there are mechanisms that can actually force a victim to testify. Yeah. A witness to testify yeah. in general. Yeah. The evidence acts provide for that, where you can either, you know, cite the uh, it's called um, what's it called a refractory witness. Mm. You know, refractory. a refractory witness. Basically, <laughs> this is a witness who's not cooperating uh -huh. in in the course yeah. of trial. Yeah. So what the court ordinarily does is, you know, in a zamua kukufunga as a witness ah, for eight okay. days to think about whether it is you want to proceed with the case or not. <laughs> After eight days, you come back and report and say, yeah. "Look, I do not want." Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, for for that particular aspect, the court can do it over and over again. Oh, okay. You okay. get. Now it gets when it gets to a point where now. The court sees that, fine, the, the court and you as a prosecutor, you've assessed the case and you're like, this person is not going to cooperate with me, irrespective of what happens. Then now then you declare them as a hostile witness. The challenge of that as well is the evidence of a challenge of, of, a hostile, of a hostile witness is weak. Is very weak. Yeah. But okay. that, that part, the witnesses and victims can actually be compelled, though it's not encouraged. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And I especially think, past, uh, victims of uh, gender-based violence, yes. It would really be uh, almost uh, uh, inhuman yes. to force them to to, to, to testify, and mm. it's uh, them who have been uh, harmed. Yeah. Uh, yes, mm. but you see, sometimes it's the public interest. Yes, yes. Uh, it's just not that case you're looking at. Generally, you there's a message uh, the the prosecutor has to. Uh, to, 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 to pursue yeah. to the public, yeah. you want to tell the public this is not okay. Yeah. You can't beat somebody, and just because you have the strength to beat them, and then you, yeah. you, you, you. I just wanted to ask actually about the decision to charge. How do you make the decision to charge SGBV cases? Is it the same as other cases? You look at the public interest and evidentiary. 
Yes. You have to you have to look at the evidence. You have to look at the evidence without doubt, just like the other the other cases. You, the must you have to look at the evidence. Is it sufficient? Is it something which, uh, um, if if it placed before court, is going to be acceptable and all this? So the decision to just charge is the same. It applies to all cases. Yeah, okay. Yes. Does plea bargain apply in SGB, SGBV cases? Bail and bond, diversion, those we have to talk about mm. those here. I'll talk about SGB, uh, <laughs> sexual violence. Yes. You can't plead again. Uh -huh. That one is, it, it doesn't, it, it's so clear in the, in the, in the criminal yeah. procedure code. But other forms of violence, yes, like that domestic violence, there is that room for plea bargain. Mm. Um, to that extent. But uh, sexual, uh, sexual offenses? You Not can't. Yeah. Mm. No. Bail, bond, everybody has a right. Everybody yes. has a right. Uh, but uh, you know, at times you also have to look at uh, the, the situation surrounding that particular offense. Uh, mm -hmm. And when I say this, of course, I have in mind the Romeo and Juliet kind of cases. Yes. Uh, mm. You really have to, because at times when you look at this particular kind of cases, yeah, you, you're better off having, in my opinion, this particular case is dealt with by other mechanisms other than the court process. Mm -hmm. You get some of these people need psychosocial you yes. know, a therapy. Let yes. me put it that way. With a pattern, boyfriend, girlfriend, almost the same age. Uh, Sometimes the 15, same 15, age. 15, 15, 15, 16. Mm. You know, so there's a way you should look at I think at you really particular... need to come out clearly with that because I know a lot of discussions online and in other spaces have been yeah. the boy child suffers more in Romeo and Juliet cases. So the thing is, and this is something that I think the public should understand, is that, number one, as I said, a child cannot give consent for that particular act. What happens in most situations is that when we have that Romeo and Juliet kind of situation, whereby you look at, because you have to assess the age of the minor as well, right? It can't be a three-year-old and a 17-year-old, and then yeah. you say, oh, Romeo and Juliet, no. Yeah. Say 13, 15. So probably the child, it's a boyfriend-girlfriend situation. Uh, but the boy gets arrested, the girl is a victim. Yes. What people don't realize is that this boy is also a victim. And the guy should also be charged for defilement. <laughs> no, okay. it, it, it is a truth. But public perception is mm. the boy child is 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 what is the accused yes. and the girl child is taken. That is public for... perception. Yes. But that's not what the what the law expects. Uh -huh. That is not what the expectation of the law is not that it's only the boy who is the perpetrator. If now, as children, now they say, they sit down and say, fine, we are agreeing to have, you know, sexual, because, you know, in, in law, we always told that you say things as they are, you know, yeah. don't try to camouflage it. Or you so, will say it as it yeah, is. as it is. You, you can sit down as a, as, as a 14, no, not 14, say a 15-year-old boy and a 15-year-old girl and say, fine, I'm going to have sex with you. And then you have sex. And then now, when now the parent comes to realize that this has happened, the boy is the one who goes yeah. to jail. And I think I had one instance where I raised issue with that particular situation mm -hmm. and you know the mother to the to the girl unfortunately the mother to the girl was very quick to have the boy arrested or when they mm. continue only for and you know these are those files that we always encourage the police officers to ensure that they have a comprehensive file yeah in stbv uh, matters because there's, there's a way they do some officers do statements mm -hmm. you know it, it leaves it leaves a lot leaves to be desired. Room, gaps yes yeah so you, you you look at the situation, and when I raise question and ask, look, then why why is the boy the only person who's been charged and the girl has been rescued? Mm -hmm. Yet in their statement, all of them are saying we are boyfriend and girlfriend, and we agreed to do to do this particular mm -hmm. act. So I gave direction and said, look, let everyone be arrested. The file went back to the office, and they moved. Oh. When I asked the OCS, hey, what's happening around this case? Because they're waiting for the file, we do a letter. Because some of these people moved away, they ran away. Some of them Oh. It happens. It happens. Yes, unfortunately. Yeah. But as I said, the law as it's drafted does not just protect the, the girl child alone. It also protects the interests and not rights the of the boy child as well. Yeah. So in such cases, you're not accusing them of any SGB. It, it's under SGBV, but... SGBV, yeah. but in most circumstances, those are children in need of care and protection. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. And not trust busy, there's not... You know, what should be seen is this. When children of that age are committing, are having a sexual uh, encounter, yes. what they do mm -hmm. 
just imagine a situation where adults, an adult has been forcefully uh, uh, forced to have uh, sex with yeah. another person. Mm -hmm. You charge them. Yes. So in the, it, the circumstances should be similar to these two young mm -hmm. ones. Mm -hmm. Even if they, they, they are not allowed to have consent, the fact is that was there any force amongst one to the other? If there was no force, the way you will handle that situation yes. at their age is the same way you will handle adults. Yes. So we have to be... Yeah. I mean, there was no force, but... <laughs> Both of you then have committed the offense, the offense and you should be processed by the children's uh, department. Exactly. They should uh, uh, they, they should cancel these children because they're actually in, in need of care yeah. and they need to be advised. Yeah. So, so that's it. And actually, one thing that I think should be encouraged even in practice is that in such situations, I've seen it happen in some jurisdictions. That's within Kenya. Yeah. Uh, whereby where it's a Romeo and Juliet case. Mm -hmm. Before that case even comes to court, mm -hmm. the file has been completed, mm -hmm. evidence has been gathered, there's sufficient evidence. Mm -hmm. The first recommendation that is actually made mm -hmm. before even charging is that this person then goes to the children's office first for a report to be prepared to the court for consideration mm -hmm. as to whether this person needs to go to yeah. the, the, whatever procedures they have, the psychoso uh, psychosocial mm -hmm. uh, procedures is all the you know, mm. all those things that yeah. before you even consider charging in the first place. Mm. And I believe in my experience as a prosecutor, that was one of the most efficient courts in dealing with sexual gender-based violence in terms of Romeo's and Romeo and Juliet's. Juliet's. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so clearly we're saying there's no out-of-court settlement with SDBB cases. No out-of-court settlement. No out-of-court settlement. That time was... Actually, it's an offense. Yeah. It's an offense under the Sexual Offenses Act. Yeah. Interference, completely. It's an offense which Section 35, if yes. I'm not wrong, yes. if uh, you, you are, it's it's seen as interfering with the with the the, the process, the oh. court process. Yeah, it's okay. an offense. And then we have alternative to justice in SGBV cases. Emma, that's what you've just talked about now. That's, that's what, what we've talked about, about now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good. So maybe just quickly and uh, briefly, um, what are some of the interventions put in place by ODPP? What what do you have for SDB? Oh, so much has been done. Yes. Uh, so much has been done. Immediately, the mm -hmm. Sexual Offences uh, Act came into force. Mm -hmm. uh, the office, uh, the DPP established the SGBV division, the Sexual and Gender Based Division, which specifically manages or coordinates all offences in the whole country mm -hmm. on issues of SGBV. So that if there's a report which has been made out there in the social media, in, in whichever platform we are quick to, to coordinate. So the, we have the SGBV mm -hmm. uh, department. We have continuous training, continuous training of the, the prosecutors yeah. uh, and other law enforcement agencies. Mm -hmm. Um, we have um, uh, what we call uh, clinics where we, we uh, how can I put it, clinics where we, uh, even internally within the office, yeah. where we keep on um, mentoring, mentoring our yes. own prosecutors on how to manage SGBV. So I know there are so many interventions. Uh, those are some of the interventions. Yes, okay, thank yeah. you so much. So we yeah. go to social. Um, uh, Linda, thank you. This is YouTube. Uh, Linda, thank you very much. For you for watching, she says very informative discussion. Thanks, Gitonga. Well done, Madam Nyamosi and Mr. Ongira. Viola Wakuthi, thank you very much. Well done, Madam Nyamosi and Mr. Ongira, following the discussion. Uh, Rosemary, thank you. Christine, thank you. Um, thanks, Eddie, for watching. So I'll just go to Facebook and I'll ask the first question. Uh, thanks, Olisa. She says great and timely discussion. Luke asks, can defilement case be withdrawn outside the court? Why is it so in case the minor agree with the person who defiled her to withdraw the matter? Is it possible? No. The answer is no. A big no. Okay. There's no other way of answering. So no matter what agreement you make out of court, this case has to go on. It has to go on and the one who is interfering is the yes. one we are saying we will charge. Mm. Look at it from this perspective. It goes back to consent. Mm -hmm. From from the question he's raised, yeah. it's like more or less getting into an agreement with a, a minor, minor in a the minor. first place. Yeah. It's okay. not practical. Mm. Number two, you cannot now go then to the parent and say like, look, we have agreed with the parent to... But it happens, right? But the question is, who is the victim? At the end of the day, who is the victim? The victim has no voice. So your parent and maybe the uncle, the uncles will sit and say, we have agreed this case ends here. We see Ibishe familia. Mm. And at Tulipa Ngombe 50, mm. then now what happens? The victim cannot speak up. Can I tell you who will speak for the victim? Who? The, the prosecutor, yes. the state. 
that is when now you literally take up the case. And if it means that you have to rescue this child from this place, from place. you will rescue the prosecutor becomes the voice uh -huh. of the child. Yes, yes. Okay. yes. Okay, interesting. So Luke again asks, whereby a girl child was forced to involve in a sexual activity with an older person for her parents to get food, then the man is arrested. And when in court, the girl pretends not to be knowing that man. What evidence do you rely on on such situation? This is an indecent proposal. What on a nja enda kwa nani amesema uende alafu anatupatia pesa. Then now that guy is accused. I mean, what do you do in this case? Again, this is Africa. This is Kenya. Those cases are possibly so many out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and poverty is can bite, and things people go to certain extents that you can't believe. Exactly. <laughs> what do you do? What evidence do you rely on on such situation? Not in identification, <laughs> let me just say this. In sexual, gender-based violence, especially defilement, rape, and whatnot, identity of the suspect is very key. Yeah. You can never go wrong on that. Mm -hmm. And that is why one of the things that uh, police officers are encouraged to actually do, and which they should be doing on a day-to-day -day basis, irrespective of whether this particular person is known to the victim, is conducting an ID parade. Mm -hmm. Those things are just not on TV. Those things are <laughs> parade. No, 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 no. An ID parade it is very essential. Yeah. Because, and let me just spell out the ingredients now and so that yeah. then they understand what they are. Number one ingredient in defilement, for instance, the age of the minor, mm -hmm. right? That can be attested to either by the birth certificate, uh, birth notification, or the evidence of the mother, mm -hmm. right? Number two, if there was penetration, that's now where you have the P, uh, the, the post-trip yeah. care form, the P3 form to indicate that. Number three, identity of the suspect. You can never go wrong. And I, and, and I think there has been a complaint in society mm -hmm. that most men are languishing in, in the prison yes. <laughs> because of this third aspect of identity, that this third ingredient, identity. I'm not the one who did it. Yeah. I'm not the one, even, even after conviction, Ukenda kusikia story yao kinyo atasema. Misi kwa hapo. Si mimi nilifanya ipo. You know? Yeah, it said that like half the, 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 the population in prison didn't do half, it. Half of it didn't do it. <laughs> but that is something you can't go wrong with. Yeah. As long as an ID parade had been conducted, then we are That's good to yeah. go. Okay. Yes. So uh, again, another case. Thanks, Luke, for your questions. In case a girl you misagree, I think you disagree after mm. sex about money, then she goes ahead and reports the matter as rape. Will you consider the man or woman who will be guilty now? These are the circumstances <laughs> which um, you must have stories for this. Yeah? Um, sometimes that is why it's very very important sometimes to 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 pretry some of these witnesses. Ah. Uh, on the face of it, there is an offense. Yes. It's so clear. Yes. But when you engage the victim. Do you know you'll realize, especially if it's an adult, some of them even have, uh, uh, usually use sexual offenses to settle scores. Yes. When you're pre-trying, which is mandatory, you're supposed to pre-try your witness uh, uh, victim, that is when you're able to identify. And, you know, you're, you're left with no choice as a, as, as a prosecutor, but to, to, to give justice yeah. as it is, you'll have to withdraw that case. I mean, of course, with the consultation, yeah. with the consultation of the DPP. Mm -hmm. But here is a case we will find that this person was uh, uh, wrongly uh, accused, accused. Yeah. and it happens. Yeah. I, we have had those situations where people have their own uh, rendezvous, a man and a woman, and then maybe the man refuses to pay, but she will cry rape, and it's a case of one. Uh, he's Howard. Yeah. So. So pre-trial yeah. is again, important. Pre is very again, important. Just, 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 just to mention, like I said initially, mm. that the office has developed an, all, uh, an open door policy. And what I think most people don't realize mm -hmm. is that anyone can actually make a complaint okay. to the office of the DPP, mm -hmm. be it the victim mm -hmm. or the accused mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. So if there's, there are circumstances surrounding, you know, of that nature, even the suspect himself can actually make a complaint. That then warrants us to call for the file, mm. to be look at it, mm. and to raise questions to get to know what exactly transpired in the mm. first place. Okay. So they're actually encouraged to do that. Yeah. Yes. So another question again by Luke is a situation where a man was beaten, I don't know if it is Kuuma ama Kuchapwa, by his wife, but without any witness presence present, will that woman be prosecuted? Again, pre-trial? Pre-trial... Mm. 
and the pressure of evidence as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. But like we're saying, men will rarely go and and report. Men will rarely go to report mm-hmm. unless unless they have a f- unless they have a notion yeah. or a feeling that the woman might go report uh, go to report first. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's who now, gets uh, there first. Who gets there first. first. Yes. Most of them. <laughs> oh, nilifika pale na nikampata pale mshafika na ana report. So mimi yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. All right. Um, Olisa asks, to what extent has a prosecution adopted victim impact assessment? I don't know what that means. Maybe you'll define that for us a bit. Mm-hmm. And the provision of the Victim Protection Act with, with regard to compensation of victims in prosecution, prosecuting SO cases. Those are sexual offenses cases, right? Yes. 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 Mm-hmm. So to what extent has a prosecution adopted victim impact assessment? What is that, first of all? Uh, a victim impact statement is a statement which uh, provides uh, the, the the negative impact or the or what has uh, been visited upon the the victim yeah. so that you understand uh, uh, and it helps usually when sentencing is being made yeah actually we have uh, when when we do our um, uh, continuous uh, trainings to prosecutors. We encourage prosecutors to use the victim victim impact statement mm-hmm. as it, it should be actually part of standard. of the, it should it's be standard. standard. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's uh, something which we encourage uh, prosecutors, uh, prosecutors to use, and we work hand in hand with the other bodies, other right. agencies, Profession. to assist us with the the the, the assessment. Okay. Mm. So the provisions of the Victim Protection Act with regard to compensation of victims. Mm-hmm. In prosecuting sexual offenses cases, sexual SO cases. So did you get it? That is compensation. I can repeat. Oh, um, you're talking about the compensation, yes. which is yeah. in the. Uh, uh, actually, um, and this is something again. Uh, I've had a case uh, where a victim was also violated. Even the Sexual Offences Act also provides for that yeah. opportunity. Yeah. Do you know it's the victims that uh, we uh, the victims. Uh, uh, should be compensated, and when you talk about the the, the act, they should be. Co- it's a process which should be done. Yeah. Uh, it's something which we should continue, and we would encourage actually advocates who are uh, representing the victims to pursue this angle. Mm-hmm. Even the Sexual Offences Act allows yeah. for that yeah. for a victim to be compensated. Oh, uh, you should yeah. know that it doesn't end at, convi- at yeah. conviction. At yeah. conviction, there, there are is th- more that can actually be yeah. be, be done. To compensate victims. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Robina asks. Thanks, Robina, for your question. There is this issue in your office when you take a different case to register, and there is no birth certificate or anything to show the actual age of the minor being an investigation officer. You are being told to release the suspect on police cash bail, and yet once the suspect is released, he disappears, and yet at the hospital, no age assessment could be conducted without a court order. This must be an actual. Thing that happened to someone here mm. yeah well uh to, to address that particular issue i always say that police officers have the advantage of knowing what happens in the first place they are the first contact persons when it comes to victims of yeah of, of, uh, SGBV. of sgbv mm-hmm. and what i must say is that and i always tell people this like a cop will never stop you for no reason whatsoever we can debate this that. The, can debate, but, but, but this is saying for the reason that I can consume a mission because I will be fine. If, 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 if <laughs> we can debate that, yeah. yes, but I can attest to this. If a cop stops you and tells you, Nimekushika kwa sababu ya sababu flani, I'm not Nimekusmamisha kwa sababu ya kitu flani, believe you me, at the back of his mind, he's, he has an idea of the offensive committed. Most likely, Kunale, of course, on attack. Not in yeah. but. There are those things that happen. There are those exceptions. Yes. Yeah. But a majority of them mm. know what exactly it is they are doing. That I'll, I will say for a fact. Yeah. So officers should know. By having that benefit of having the 24 hours of investigating and the opportunity of actually even applying for miscellaneous to conduct investigations, ordinarily, when they see that there's an aspect or something that is missing in that particular file, what then they should do? is actually available to us files. Even if, for instance, they're given like three days to do investigations, even one day to inve- to just look at the file and give directions, what needs to be done, what points need to be covered is essential. It's unfortunate that some of the officers 
in the sub county levels yeah. you know they want to come to you in the morning mm -hmm. they've had a file investigated the file for over three days mm -hmm. then they come to you in the morning for five minutes mm -hmm. you see an issue and when you raise that issue they hit the roof i am so glad that the act right the odpp act gives the dpp and prosecutors the exclusive discretion for making the decision to charge mm -hmm. like i said initially age is a very critical ingredient in determining uh, mm -hmm. the nature of offense and even sentencing mm -hmm. because i believe it's categorized from zero to zero to, zero to yeah you see oh, so okay. it's important to have all those things in the yeah. first place yeah. without that you can't charge in the first place and mm -hmm. we don't charge for the sake of charging we charge because it's sufficient evidence mm -hmm. so what we'll do is actually encourage them to always at least be in communication with officers from uh, with, with, with the officers prosecutors that is you know yeah. if they have an issue i believe all of them have most officers within our sub counties and county levels they have numbers for prosecutors yeah call to consult these are the situations that i'm actually having how what do i do yeah. how do i go about it yeah. we will always and we are always we are ready and willing mm. to give directions on what then they should do to cover those points mm. so that should not it should actually not even be an issue in the first place <laughs> Okay, I think in every session we have a star student and today we have Luke. Luke has questions. <laughs> it's very important to recognize his contribution. Yes. So he says, without witnesses, the SGBV cases can, can they, pro he's asking, can SGBV cases be proceed without witnesses in case the man does grievous harm to his wife when there are only the two of them? And I think we've talked about this. If, yeah. uh, you, you, you see, you can't say without witnesses mm -hmm. because even if it's the man, the man and the wife, mm -hmm. and that is the victim and the victim and the suspect yeah. you must realize that the doctor who examines this particular lady ah, is a witness a the investigating officer is a witness as well mm -hmm. this is the first contact person that actually the first two people mm -hmm. who she probably had contact with mm -hmm. when she made this particular report mm -hmm. you get they also become witnesses exactly yeah officers should go to the scene mm -hmm. you know uh, scene of crime process yeah. the scene and all that yeah. before you come to court at yeah. the end of the day let the court make us uh, make its assessment mm -hmm. on the basis of the evidence that has been gathered mm -hmm. and tendered in court. Mm -hmm. So okay. yes, even the if it's just continues. the wife, the case continues either okay. way. Okay. Yes. Uh, so on YouTube, Carol Gigi says a great discussion, Madam Nyamosi and Mr. Ongira. Then Peter asks, what is being done about out of court settlement for these SGBV cases? Looks like they're quite a number, and maybe there needs to be enlightenment at the community level about this out of court story. I think, uh, mm -hmm. again, it comes down to culture. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's not that, let us not uh, bury our heads in the sand, pretend mm -hmm. we don't know. We know that these things are Happen, going on. Yes. They are happening, and people are doing them, and they are wrong. Yes. And there are sometimes, uh, it's because it's based on, as we say, culture, practice, or... And religion. And, uh, and, and religion. Yes. Uh, I know that um, even the reporting of sexual offences came because of the robust, you know, sensitization. Yeah. I think now we should just go back, especially in the areas. Mm -hmm. We know that uh, areas in the coast region mm -hmm. have that, uh, coastal region have that problem, very, very big problem. In the, the northeastern, they have that problem also, yes. where religion uh, plays and, yeah, a yeah, culture. Inter yeah. Yes. So what I think we should go out there, just that COVID has really been a big challenge. Because when you're sitting with the wazes, you have to sit with the wazes themselves in the baraza. Talk to them and tell them, hey, this is not right. We are aware you are doing this, you're going, uh, you're uh, settling these cases out of court. Um, so that uh, we also are not uh, having people... Uh, uh, convicted just for the sake of, uh, you know, charging people for interfering mm -hmm. when they might not even really understand, understand yes. what under, understand what is happening. So I, I think uh, we should not forget that yeah. we need to continue. Maybe it's just safe to say yeah. culture and religion because I mean, when you look at religion, the Bible yes. in itself says you can only yes. divorce, yes. for example, yes. under cases of infidelity. Yes. There's no provision for such things. Yeah. yeah. And, and I believe yeah. there's also need for civic education for, yeah. you know, the yeah. public as well yeah when it comes to these particular issues as well yeah. mm. it's very important yeah. without that there's mm. nowhere actually will be headed to in terms of yes adr yeah in the stbv adr is what the next alternative <laughs> dispute resolution <laughs> okay <laughs> all right yeah it's adr yeah. i wanted to ask something and i'm really we're running out of time can the introduction of a sex offenders registry work in kenya yes it is there oh the sexual when the the sexual uh the 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 task force on the sexual offenses 
Act, the task force actually initiated what you call the CJ rules. Yes. The CJ rules and the, the, the register. This register is supposed to be processed at the, the it's the court or the judiciary which is supposed to process, I mean, uh, process this register. Mm -hmm. This register. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we still need to go back and engage yeah. uh, as, through the NCAJ. Yes. This register is supposed to be implemented, right? Wow. Uh, yes, it is, is it, there. Is it like CRB, like it is noted there and, and in against your name that you run a section of Yes. Them? Oh. That is what it's supposed to be. That's what the register is all about. Okay. Yes. We can't exhaust this topic definitely. And we will continue. <laughs> like I have so many questions. So we have to come to an end yes. uh, of this discussion today. But then it doesn't end here. We can always engage on social media. Keep asking. You'll keep getting responses from the team who are online and waiting to respond. I want to come to an end of this discussion today. It's not the end, like I'm saying, we'll continue with it in the coming week. So just continue asking questions as they, as they arise. I want to thank you for joining us today and for engaging, and of course, for our star student, Luke. You really uh, kept us engaged today. Uh, you're welcome again to join us next week, and of course, on Facebook and on Twitter. I want to wish you a blessed day ahead, and of course, a, good, a restful weekend, and a blessed week uh, from, uh, from Sunday. Uh, God bless, and have a good day. Thank you.